It felt good. No, it felt good. Okay, Chris, we're live. So, um, hi. Hi, um, Jonathan. Yeah, my first responsibility is to uh, welcome the audience and uh, let everyone know that we have over 460 people um, from 32 different countries. And uh, I'd list them all, but it might sound like a kind of a bad wedding speech. So I'll just say that um, Argentina is really well represented, Chris. You know, you have a big support. Terrific. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I'm moderator tonight or today, and um, but really just doing the interview. And my name is Jonathan Bailey. I'm currently the president of Natural State. And before that, I was chief scientist at National Geographic Society. And before that, director of conservation at the Zoological Society of London. And currently I'm sitting here in Kenya. We just had a power cut and there was, there was some, some nerves, but we've managed to get things. I'm, I'm hot spotting, so I'm back. Um, but I'm sitting at a place um, which is just at the base of Mount Kenya. And uh, it's part of a larger project called the Northern Rangelands Trust, which is, which is also a large landscape scale project, um, which sort of follows in the, uh, in the same, um, same structure as many of the ones that uh, Chris has set up. So um, this has all been made possible by uh, Satopia Travel and Journeys with Purpose. And this is part of a series, it's called Dare to Dream. And it's really highlighting um, a few individuals around the world who, who have had the, who, you know, ha had these crazy dreams of of protecting and restoring the natural world at massive scale, and have had the audacity to really dream at scale, uh, but not only that to actually achieve it. And um, and I can't think of anyone better to kind of that represents all of that uh, than you, Chris. And uh, we have 45 minutes to chat and I couldn't be more pleased. Great. Um, but before getting into it, I'm just gonna do a little really, really quick sort of bio on you just so that, you know, people have some background. So the, um, the first is obviously uh, Chris is president and co-founder of Tomp Tompkins Conservation. And uh, everyone knows that Chris uh, had a, a long and successful career as CEO of Patagonia. Um, but throughout Chris's life, she's been committed to protecting and restoring the natural world. And uh, in that has, has set up national parks, has, has uh, really driven almost a new style of, of uh, restoration at scale, um, has inspired others, including myself, and um, has thought a lot about uh, the places where she's working and the people, uh, and that we can't uh, just think about restoration on its own, but how we create almost a conservation economy where um, there's these, these areas can be viable for people and for biodiversity. Um, and through Tompkins Conservation, uh, Chris and uh, her late husband, Doug, um, along with other NGOs and, and uh, philanthropists and, and particularly government, um, have together secured 14.5 million acres uh, in Chilean Patagonia, which, which makes Chris and uh, her late husband two of the two of the most impressive and uh, impactful conservationists of our era. So it's a great honor to, uh, to be able to speak with you for 45 minutes, Chris. But before I dig in, I, I, di I did get, go through uh, Instagram uh, today. And uh, while I was looking at it, this, this image popped up of these kind of wild cats dancing and it all looked kind of socially responsible and it looked, um, it, well, it was a Zoom rave. It was a Zoom rave of jaguars. And I saw you sort of dancing in the corner. And I thought before we jumped into all this, you could explain a bit about the, uh, the jaguar and the, the deeper meaning behind it. Well, the, the jaguar rave was celebrating uh, uh, a real moment of this 10-year project we've had to bring back the keystone species in Ibera wetlands, which is roughly 2 million acres of pretty much no conflict zone. So when we thought about bringing back the keystone species that were missing, which were several, the jaguar, of course, was the most complex. And um, we've had a lot of uh, steps forward and a couple steps back, but 10 days ago, the first jaguars of this project, three of them, walked into freedom and won't look back. And we have other individuals who are on their way to have uh, their own freedom. So, so yesterday, 
I wanted to have a party, which in COVID is really hard for us to do. We have an incredible team in Chile. We have teams in north and south of Argentina. We have the team up here in, in the US. And of course, I'm here in California because of COVID. So we decided to have a Jaguar costume party. And uh, well, we invited all sorts of people. And then at the end, as Argentines will, they put on this rock and roll music, the Rolling Stones, and we danced. It was crazy. We danced and went nuts for, I don't know, an hour until one of the lines went down and, and the Jaguar rave was over. But it was to celebrate the people on the ground who for 10 years have been working on this in circumstances that are pretty tough. So that's that was the Jaguar rave. There were 40 plus of us on Zoom yesterday dressed up as Jaguars. <laughs> that's amazing and well and congratulations and when you have the macaw rave can you make sure you invite yes me? no you'll definitely be invited to the macaw rave which will be coming up now okay so <laughs> good you have and to some work other on your costume yeah. Uh, good. yeah i will for sure um now chris i want to go right back to the beginning and sort of where are you well where are you now i'm at our family ranch here in a small ag town in california not too far from santa barbara and it's been a great place to, to create a monastery, essentially. I came out of Chile on one of the last flights. Um, at the end of March, I thought maybe I would stay down there. And then I just thought, for a lot of reasons, I better get going. And, I, and I'm here and will remain here until... I can get vaccinated and get settled down and then go down to the Southern Cone. That sounds pretty good. So Chris, can you tell the audience, you know, where you grew up, how you first engaged with nature and, and you know, really how you, you formed that bond with the natural world that's made you achieve all the things you have? Well, I, I grew up in the same small town we grew up on our great grandfather's ranch, so we were fourth generations on the same property, and certainly were we were called the hooligans when we were growing up because we were outside all the time. We had horses, we had chores, we would fight with each other and our cousins, and and it wasn't a conservation relationship with the outdoors in those days. It was just how we were living. And I think that really um, had an impact on all of us. And then through beginning to work with Yvonne Chouinard and when he was still making rock and ice climbing equipment, um, I, when I finished my college studies, I went back to him and I had no idea what I was supposed to be doing with my life. So I just started working for him again for $2.50 an hour. And a couple of years later, he decided he wanted to make clothing for all of, uh, for climbers and, you know, like us ski racers and so on. And that were, that became Patagonia. And I was 21 then. And uh, within a few years, I started managing everything for the Chouinard family. And then I became the CEO and and then I found myself in my 40s and began to think that uh, I'd never done anything else and I, I wasn't sure what to do. But by then, we, and this had a lot to do with Yvonne and Melinda Chouinard, who were very clear about what was happening to the natural world, the devastation of forests and, and so on. And in the mid 80s, they wanted, to give away 10% of our profits to environmental causes. And that became uh, one of the great schools to not only open my eyes and see what was really going on, but also exposed to a lot of activists and people working on the ground through this, um, this donating 10% of the profits, which eventually Yvonne changed to be 1% of, of the 
sales because everybody knows that you can hide, you can do anything with profits. And if you're not making a profit, you're still doing damage to the earth. So you should market on something that uh, is real. And my, the person who would become my husband uh, had started the North Face and sold that. And then with his former wife, Susie, started a spree company, which was a fashion company that did quite well. And he, about the same time, was having the same feeling that, that while very proud of everything he had done, he too realized that um, there's a kind of, I won't call it a calling, but a desire to change everything about his life. And, and I did too. And the nut of that is that in 93, I, I resigned my post as CEO on a Friday and went to South Chile on Sunday, two days later. And we, over the last 28 years, have been so fortunate to have been able financially to acquire large tracts of land, but that was just the beginning, really. Working with 10 different governments down there and, and, and realizing that a lot of our projects, uh, they looked beautiful, pristine, but in fact, they were not. They needed a lot of restoration and specifically rewilding of keystone species. And that was about 15 years ago. And Chris, what was so it besides just, about... just making national parks, this was this became an equal leg to the stool. Chris, what was it about um, Argentina and, and Chile and Latin America that, that, that drew you? And what was that experience like when you first got there? And, and at what point did you realize that you know, this is what you wanted to do? Well, the reason we ended up in Chile was because in 1961, Doug was a ski racer as well, and he was training down there and he didn't have any money. So before training camp or afterwards, he would hitchhike around the Southern Cone between Argentina and Chile. And he really fell in love with it. So 30 years later, when he was leaving San Francisco and his business life, uh, that region was one of the regions he really uh, sought to go back to and to think about. Um, and I, I didn't go down into Patagonia, which was on the Argentine side until 1990. And for me, it was, I just thought, I understand this place. I recognize this place. It reminded me a lot of the steppes of Tibet, which I fell in love equally with. And I love the, the, solitude of it. I love the, there's such a grittiness about so much of that territory. And, and then of course, we didn't actually start in the grasslands. We started with temperate rainforest because Doug had found this place and thought, uh, I can make a, I can make something out of this. This is forest that's threatened. And I want to try to work against that destiny. And then you'd, you'd had such a successful career in the sort of not corporate, but corporate world. And um, then you stepped into the conservation world though, in your work before you always had a focus on conservation, but what, what lessons did you learn or what, did, what experience did you gain in your working career uh, with Patagonia that, that has helped you succeed in the conservation world? Because not a lot well, of conservation. I think there are a lot of things. Many... I think there well, are a lot of things that you take from your business world and apply it to conservation. Uh, I I think that also can be said for other walks of life and applying it to something else. But in our case, or I'll speak for myself. In my case, um, being in business makes you very results driven. Uh, planning, but not too much planning. <laughs> um, there's a there's a sense of sort of going for broke. And uh, then the, the sort of the operational side working doing budgets, five year plans, 
really setting a course everybody understood and a kind of take no prisoners approach to conservation. And a lot of that came from Doug because Doug, like Yvonne, they're truly entrepreneurs. Doug was, Yvonne still is. They, they, they never think something's impossible. Doug's motto was always commit and then figure it out. Now that's not coming out of a business book, <laughs> but we had, I, I feel so lucky to have been 50 years combination between the two because I'm more of a, a dog with a bone and I like difficult things that are kind of impossible and then I love to get there. So they were really in my life, two men who are real visionaries and my, my ability is to un, let them unfold. And, and I think a lot of that uh, confidence comes from being responsible for people for so long and, and really being the one that if the sun shines, you're a hero. And if it, and if it doesn't, you're in a swamp. So, and I don't mind that, I guess. <laughs> Where do you think that, that courage comes from to, to sort of face adversity and face a great challenge and just keep going? And you know, you, you've dealt with many challenges and, and you've managed to just sort of pick up and, and maintain that vision and, and have that courage uh, along with you know, the dog with the bone, but just the, the pure courage to keep going where where do you think you where do you think that came from well certainly my parents specifically our father was a real go-getter never imagined his girls couldn't become whatever else my brother our, our brother could become and very very moved us to southern venezuela when i was 8 and you know, he was, he was, I think a person, he died when I was nine. So I didn't get to know him very well, but I, in my life, I've been around these men who just saw that if you have an idea, worst case, it doesn't work, but that's not so bad. And so failing wasn't some the, the the fear of failing was just not in my lexicon i i just i'm so fortunate and i don't attribute these skills to myself i attribute it to them to the people in my life and to this day i feel like why not try to rewild jaguars why why not because if Doug always said to me, Bertie, remember Wayne Gretzky, who was a soccer, uh, well, you know, you, <laughs> he was a hot, great <laughs> hockey player. And he said, Wayne Gretzky said, you miss 100% of the shots you never take. And that really, <laughs> really, no, it really yeah. sunk in with me. So, and I try to instill that with everybody we work with. There's, the real, especially in conservation, because we're, we're really at the edge, and Jonathan, I'm sure you can speak to this, of a new, I don't want to call it an era, but a next generation of conservation. I think rewilding extirpated species, although there's been a version of that in, in points of Africa for decades, but um, going after marine systems and coastal systems and the way we're looking at things and and in many cases we'll find ourselves being the first one or at least in a small group of people trying to do something that is more aggressive or just pushing always raising the bar in terms of conservation and and looking at the 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 more complex qualities of this of the economic system and how do you how do you manage all of that and so on and so forth? And I, I think 
conservationists have nothing to lose. Yeah, I don't think pushing too far is not is is exactly what we should be doing. And I would say this whether it's social systems or natural systems. I think I think and we're living in a time when being shy about stepping out there and trying to create new ways of working better, faster, um, long-term results and so on is essential. Yeah, I think about when I first um, went to Mongolia uh, many years ago and I thought to myself, you know, I could be in conservation my whole life and and all I could really hope to do is maintain it in the state as it is when I'm visiting now. And, and it'll just slowly degrade through time. And in many ways, the conservation movement has been sort of very almost reactive or holding off, holding off the, the pressures in a sense. But what's so empowering about your approach and, and the projects that you've done is that it's, it's gone from sort of a reactive to more of a, a proactive approach and we're actually restoring and we're rewilding and we're rebuilding mm. and we're thinking about not only um, sort of these fine lines between humans and nature but but new ways of connecting with the natural world and and redefining our relationship with the natural world and that comes a lot from sort of the, the sort of deep ecology um, yes the theory that I know that you have you have uh, really helped drive forward and push. And I'm just wondering how that kind of philosophy influences influences your work. Well, of course, as you well know, deep ecology has been a highly unpopular and highly misunderstood concept from the great Norwegian philosopher Arne Næss. When you boil it all down, deep ecology, to my mind, just means that all life has intrinsic value. If you start there and just that, then that informs how we look at one another, how we, how we feel about the four or 500 people who are listening to us right now, how we feel about wolverine and grizzly bears and all life has intrinsic value. And it shifts the responsibility on us to consider every decision that we make, where do we intersect with that ethos, that ethic? And I don't wanna overly dramatize it, but I think that yes, I believe that if humans are suffering, we have work to do. If the non-human world is suffering, there is work to be done. And now again, we're at a stage where those two um, universes are colliding and the, the health and welfare of both human societies and the non-human world are really being pushed to the, to the nth degree through climate uh, extinction crisis, and leading to such things as pandemics and so on. So I, I never have thought that conservation was a real popularity contest because generally speaking, we're in the doghouse half the time. I mean, if you think about how we started in Chile nearly 30 years ago, we were highly suspicious. I know they were highly suspicious of us called the couple who cut chili in half and every other thing they said about us. And, but if you look at 25 years later, 26 years later, the Chilean governments, Chilean society has adapted, adopted their own forward motion toward conservation. They have 40% of their seas protected, um, 20, 23% of land territory. And um, so these are just, you know, it's an evolution. Chris, you're chair of um, Last Wild Places for National Geographic Society, which started the concept of 30 by 30, protecting 30% 30 of the planet by 2030. Mm. 
Mm. And um, and it's now been broadly adopted by governments around the world in the text for the Convention on Biodiversity. Do you think we will? Do you think we'll achieve the thirty by thirty, given that we're at fifteen percent of the the globe currently protected? I think it's possible. I think it's possible. Is it probable? I think that we'll get close in some ways. I think that getting off the blocks on something like this is always so complex because even people like me, you and I have had this discussion plenty of times, like which 30% is it? What? How do we define that? How do we how much of that is agriculture? How much of that is, you know, it's not gonna be, no, I don't think it's 30% of the world uh, protected and, and, and all is well. I think it's highly complex. I think it's essential that we, that's what we shoot for. And when you look at California, if you look at Chile, who's not so far off, and other countries who aren't so far off, you see that we can get over this initial rejection, which is usually based on if it's 30% of the world, the economic system will collapse. And that to me is the biggest um, conundrum for this because it's not true. And that's my puppy barking in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, I, I know you watched um, My Octopus Teacher, and oh, um, yeah, yes. and that's, I mean, for those of you who haven't seen it, um, it's definitely worth a watch, but um, we were talking about deep ecology, but I was reading something that um, Craig Foster had written, he was talking about emotional ecology, and it's about the connecting emotionally with other forms of life, the natural world, and then creating v greater value uh, on the rest of life. And I'm just wondering what what you think needs to change or how we need to do things differently to have society think differently about other forms of life um, and, and maybe mm. redefine our relationship. Great bloody question. I just wrote something about this to to a friend and he, he had sent something talking about the consciousness, human consciousness. And I wrote back saying, you know, I've spent a lot of time, as have you, Jonathan, very in very close quarters with the non-human world. And I believe that consciousness, as it's interpreted for we humans, is not special to humans. I think all life has a consciousness that is sometimes seen, absolutely, but oftentimes unseen. And I think it's a, it's one of the things that has really begun to change the way I look at all life is this, what I think is a great error to imagine that we humans are the only conscious thinking beings. And, and over time, I think that will be seen as absolutely the case. And I'm not talking about on some high elevation spiritual level, I'm talking about conscious decisions that, that um, geese make when they're flying south. It's not all just instinct with no, with no more depth to that. I'm, I'm, I know that interesting because we've, we've spent so much time trying to isolate ourselves from the rest of life. And I think um, if we look for new powerful narratives for nature that bring us closer, one is just that we're not as different as we think. And the more we learn in science, the more we learn that other species have cultures and so on. And, mm -hmm. and the more we can break down those barriers, I think your, you know, the concepts of, of basically loving other forms of life um, mm -hmm. becomes, becomes a lot easier. It's uh, but it's a bit, a bit of a transition we have to go through. Another narrative I think might be interesting to develop f further around, you know, related to COVID is the, um, the health narrative. And that, mm. um, 
that uh, mm -hmm. mental health is is not assured if we don't engage with the natural world, especially for children. And I think that science hasn't been really well developed. And the more we get that narrative around the need for us to engage with nature to be fully developed human beings, um, mm -hmm. I think the more powerful we might we might see, uh, you know, additional arguments for for nature. Um, I agree, and it's it's going forward toward that, but we've come out of of that. I'm 70 years old this year, and growing up, we were outdoors a lot, but we didn't know all the names of the birds. We weren't conscious of who was skittering through the ranch on any given day. I think even by that time, we had lost this connection with who am I a part of? Mm -hmm. What is the real citizenry of my community? So we so simplified it to be uh, other humans or pets, generally speaking. And that was a tragic loss. And I think has not put us in good stead over the last 100 years, 150 years. The, the farther we get, and I've seen this with myself, the farther we get from really understanding our place in the circle of life, the more dangerous our lives become. And I think that the pandemic has shown me that, but it's also shown me that we humans can react very quickly and globally when something really in, collapses in the system. I would never have guessed. Of course, in the United States, there are a lot of knuckleheads who don't want to wear masks and, you know, they think it's some sort of deep state uh, phenomenon. But by and large, people have really taken orders, taken suggestions, and tried to protect themselves. So we do know that humans can act on a dime if called upon. And that was tremendous because the same thing, in my opinion, is going to happen with the effects of climate chaos. Yeah, yeah. It, it's happening already, but it's more noticeable in the margins. And so that that gives me inspiration that we are capable of reacting and very quickly to dire circumstances. And I think um, this has nothing to do, I guess, with my connection with wildlife, but we we will in the most painful of ways find out why and how we are so definitely connected to nature like it or not we talked about growing up on the farm and and it was just a way of life being with nature and mm -hmm. then being at patagonia for years and i'm sure you worked like crazy and and of mm -hmm. course you you escaped to nature but i'm sure you felt a little bit removed and then sort of coming back more to it and almost in your process of rewilding, rewilding yourself. And I feel a bit of that, you know, with COVID and we just went off to the farm and I got to do all right. these things that I hadn't done since I was young. And, and we thought about living more sustainably. And then mm -hmm. you just realize you don't want to go back to, to the non rewilded state. And um, it's just interesting to think about how, how we can help society as a whole go through that rewilding process. You know, I, with all the devastation and unbelievably deep loss over the last almost 11 months now, in a very personal way, specific way, it, I think it saved me. I, I was moving around really most of my life, my business life, and then in conservation almost all the time. And suddenly I arrived here back at the ranch and I haven't been anywhere. And it has really been good for me, good for my writing, good for my state right. of mind, um, going outside and clearing rocks out to make a garden and all these things that, that I would never have done. I will never go back to the life <laughs> I was living. 
I won't. Me neither. Me neither. It was uh, flying to London because there's a meeting. All of these things are, we created that. You know, it makes us feel important. It makes us feel like we're part of the groove of what's really happening. Forget it. I don't know one person who imagines they would ever go back to the lifestyle they had before. And I think that's a good thing. I think this is a teaching moment. And I think most of us are listening. We're not going to get all of it, but a lot of it. Now, we were supposed to um, focus on Ibra a little bit. And, um, yes. the, uh, you know, it's close to your heart. And it's, you know, world famous restoration project. There's a, there's a very lucky group of 12 people that will be able to go with Satopia Travel and Journeys with Purpose and visit with you and, right. and experience the landscape. But um, for us that, that don't have that opportunity, can you just give us a, a quick description of the place, its, it's beauty, the, some of the wildlife and, and the projects you're working on? Sure. Well, I'll tell you, when, uh, when Doug and I first flew in there in 1997 and landed out in the middle of the wetlands, I got out of the plane, it was hot. This was in January. It was hot, it was buggy and it was flat and I, and it's a wetlands. And I'd never really been exposed to wetlands before. So I said, we gotta get out of here. This is, let's, let's get out of here. This isn't for us. But Doug, to his infinite credit, saw something just in that one visit and without telling me, went back to Argentina from Chile a month later and bought 150,000 acres. <laughs> the place where we where we'd uh, landed and the place where we just released the jaguars. Amazing. So in the ensuing years, it really became one of the great points of my life. It's now with our conservation work and the province of Corrientes is just under 2 million acres of really protected wetlands. One, it's the biggest wetlands in Argentina, but also one of the biggest and certainly most pristine in the wetland category around the world. And Doug really saw that it must be a gold mine for biodiversity. And it was but there were some specific species missing. And so, gosh, more than 15 years ago, we did have this epiphany. Well, we need to bring them back. If our, if our goal is fully functioning ecosystems and a place is missing so many keystone species, just protecting the wetlands itself is not enough. And it did, as you said, become one of the largest focuses for us in terms of rewilding. Today, it's, um, you can't swing a cat without running into um, some of the offspring of very early rewilding um, individuals. And it's, um, it's beautiful, it's really wild. It's, I think going out with the teams early in the morning with antenna, looking for the giant anteaters and looking for pompous deer, uh, white collared peccary, the macaws, the macaw project alone is, bringing a species back um, that has been gone for over a hundred years. A project I thought, oh, I don't know, that sounds too hard. And of course now we have them flying and we have baby chicks who just fledged in the wild. Um, there's one of them. Of course, I was hoping for the pin feather photo. The, uh... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Oh my goodness. <laughs> there they go. They are, they are something. So when people come to visit us, we really, what we want is that they go out in the field with us. 
and we have incredible biologists, all sorts of people out there going out looking for uh, members of the new community, regardless of the species, and talking, sitting on the ground, talking about what's been going on, what's up, what are the problems we're having, what's coming up, and so on and so forth. I, I think uh, it's a great combination to also having a really kind of chic place to stay at night and sit around and eat cocktails and eat asados and hang out and listen to music and whatever else is going on. So we, we I don't know if most people have trips like these, but we really like our, the visits we get to be super interactive and, you know, where we go, they go. And I just think the experience is so much more um, lasting. You know, it's like, look at all the times we've all been hiking and, and, uh, and what are the days we remember? We remember the days when we were freezing and miserable and you know, oh, I might die out here. Those are the days you remember. And not that anybody's gonna have trouble in Iguera, but, but I, I use that for my own thinking about what do people get out of a, a visit? And it really is talking to team members and having the chance just to see what's possible. Yeah, and I think just seeing the rewilding efforts that you have done and, and the teams and the dedication and, and the spirit that they have and the pride that they have and, and the success of the project is, that's yeah. so special to share. Now we, we have to wrap up soon, but there are some questions from the audience and uh, they've come right. in from all over the world, from South Africa, UK, Venezuela, Netherlands, and so on. Oh. And so um, many of them have been answered through the uh, discussion, but I'm just going to read um, one or two and let's, if we can do them fairly quickly and then, then we'll have to wrap up. But, oh, okay. um, but if, and, and also if people want to find out more about the, the trip or, or um, uh, and it's in September of, of next year, it's www.satopiatravel.com. Um, and you can ask any questions there as well. So a question from uh, Ed Van Kutzen in the UK. Uh, how have neighbors to your projects reacted in both the cultivated and wilderness areas? Opposition, interest, or replication? Thanks for the question. And of course, it's always a complex one to answer. It really is site specific. With the jaguars, of course, we thought this would be the most difficult of anything we've ever done. And it turns out that the communities of Corrientes that surround Ibarra Park, there are 10, and Corrientes province, provincial government were so happy to imagine that jaguars would come back after 70 years because the jaguars are their, their spirit, their, 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 uh, poof. It, they believe in the image and the power of jaguars. So we were so lucky where we would, you would think like people like Jonathan, a lot of people have had, you have to do a lot of work before you bring back a, a, a predator. But this, and they're free today as of 10 days ago, this has been a, one of the, oh, there's a little clip. This is very moving. It's a very poor video, but it is the moment that the female and her two cubs walk through the main gate and they don't and they haven't come back. I mean, we know where they are and we're it's a part of a program, but this is for us one of the great moments of our conservation life. Uh, the team there uh, headed up by Rewilding Argentina, people we've worked with for 20 years have done just an, an unbelievable job so um i've forgotten the question oh yeah the inter oh, so another another yeah. yeah we've had plenty of um issues 
well, especially with pumas in the south down in down in uh, southern Chile. Although that that also is turning around, but we've spent years working with Great Pyrenees dogs to manage changing the management of livestock so that the incidence of of uh, predators hitting on livestock could be reduced, although it will never disappear. So yeah, we have, oof, we do a lot of work with neighbors and um, government people uh, in both countries. And another quick question from Mona Luica from the International Travel Council. Can international travel make people stewards of the planet? Well, I hope so. You know, I think that there is a big gap between all of us who travel to these places we love. First of all, a lot of them are being loved to death. <laughs> and second of all, we usually come in, scrape the cream off the top and go back and we have photographs and we have stories we, we share with people we know. But I think the tourist industry and we as individuals who like to go around the world, we have to, we have to accept more responsibility and that would vary depending on the case, but leaving something behind rather than just taking something with you. I know that there are countries uh, at Rwanda to go see mountain gorillas. You, you have to pay the country, you have to pay um, on site. And I think uh, that's a huge reason, reason excuse me, <clears throat> that those populations are pretty well protected. And I think we have to be prepared to do, to share the burden of protection and conservation in all the places that we visit. I think it's, a, it's, it's sometimes just money, but a lot of times it's, a, it's making some sort of commitment that should, you know, hopefully we follow up on. That Definitely. has to change. Definitely. And um, well, I think uh, everyone who's seen this, this talk will, will um, definitely want to visit Ibera at some point in the near future. Great. Um, Hope so. This would be fun. So Chris, we're going to have to wrap it up. So I just want to right. thank uh, Satopia Travel and uh, Journey with Purpose. And I'd like to thank the audience for your amazing uh, questions and, and for your attentiveness. And um, particularly you, Chris, I think every time I have a conversation with you, I leave um, with more energy and more hopeful about the future of the planet. And uh, a lot of it just seeing you lead by example. And we're so grateful for everything that you've done. Um, and uh, we'll, you know, the, the final point and Ed Van Cutson's point was replication. If we can just replicate what you're doing at scale, we'll get to 30 by 30 for sure. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much, Chris, for your leadership. And thanks for your time and, and sharing your experience um, and the, the amazing work of you and your late husband, Doug. Well, thank you, Jonathan. And thank you, Satopia Travel and all of you listening. I would just like to say that Jonathan, the man interviewing me for the last hour, is, is one of the real leaders in a lot of these conversations. So you may not know that. Um, and he's also living in a place that is one of my favorite places on earth in Kenya. And uh, I just appreciate um, Satopia, Jonathan as a friend and colleague and thanks everybody for listening and go out in your backyard and see what's there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Uh, hopefully, I hopefully I get that invitation for the um, macaw rave very soon. Oh no, that's the next one. Is the macaw rave, and you'll okay, get one. Good. Okay. All right. <laughs> Bye. Ciao. Lots of love. Bye. Lots of love. <laughs>